It was a great story. Uh, Southern Cross was the care homes operator that uh, basically floated in 2006, having been owned by Blackstone Private Equity, uh, and this year basically ceased trading. So, a fairly catastrophic period between 2006 and this year. Uh, something went horribly wrong. And um, quite a few investors might have said, well, how could we know? I mean, I mean, the story was fantastic. This was a business that basically played on the idea that we're all getting older, uh, we all need to look after ourselves in old age, um, there's a shortage of care homes in the UK, it's uh, something the government's interested in and funds. Um, what's not to like? Uh, more and more old people, shortage of quality care homes, uh, a government pushing care into the private sector. Um, surely, as at one point the UK's biggest care home operator, this was a one-way bet. Well, it was uh, a bad one. And a lot of investors missed, presumably, at least, at least 10 big clear warning signs that you could have picked up from the accounts pretty much anywhere from 2006 onwards that all was not well. Yeah, fine. Um, once a profits warning was flashed up um, in 2008, sure the shares plunged and then recovered, um, but these red flags were there the whole way through. So what I'm going to do is to use Southern Cross as a good example of why, tedious though it seems, looking at the accounts can pay dividends. Um, it's a meaty document, there's a lot of detail buried in there, but if you're prepared to do at least some basic checks, you can pull out some of these red flags from any set of accounts, potentially. Um, at Southern Cross's case, they were kind of flashing red, um, really quite, quite glaringly, obviously. Okay, so what are they? Um, so let's go through 10 ways you can build up a picture that all is not well at a firm. Now you might say, well, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but the point is you should act on these fears. Um, if you go through these 10 red flags and just go, well, the story still stacks up, so sod it, I'll stay invested, well, more for you. Um, so what are these red flags? I'm gonna start with some that um, basically come from the accounts, but as we go through, I'll flag up one or two other obvious ones that you could have picked up just by reading the media or just by following the story as it unfolded. Okay, so care homes business, um, growing fast in theory and uh, taking on more and more old people who need to care in their old age. Um, big chunk of their business, around 80% funded by the government and obviously a private money accounting for the other 20. Right, so what were the red flags? First of all, um, you need a basic understanding of profit and loss accounts and balance sheets. Now, for anyone who doesn't have a basic understanding um, of those two key statements, I've got two videos, what is profit and what is a balance sheet. Strongly recommend you take a look at those. But in a nutshell, the profit and loss account is the one that everyone looks at. That's the one the directors want you to see. And there was a red flag sitting right smack in the middle of Southern Cross's profit and loss account, which I'll talk about in a moment. The balance sheet is actually more important. Let's say that again. The balance sheet is more important. In fact, given a choice between the profit and loss account, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement, if someone said which one should you pay most attention to, the answer is the balance sheet. And I'm backed up on this by Sir David Tweedy. Okay, if you don't know who that is, look him up. Um, chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board, the accountant's accountant, knighted for his contribution to accountancy. That's a lot of accountancy. Um, so he's always said investors should pay more attention to balance sheets. So you don't have to take it from me, take it from him. Profit and loss accounts, of course, are easier to read and that's where the directors would probably rather you focused your time. So profit and loss account snapshot of the last 12 months in business terms. What are we sold? What did it cost us? What do we walk away with in terms of a profit? The balance sheet is a snapshot of what, in theory, the company is worth in accounting terms at any one point in time. And the crucial thing about the balance sheet is it tells more of a story. It's cumulative. It reflects all the decisions taken by the directors to get to where they are at the point the balance sheet's published. It's not a one-year snapshot, which the profit and loss account is. 
Okay, so what could you have discovered from the balance sheet of Southern Cross if you'd been looking? Now, the balance sheet, the profit and loss account, the cash flow statement are buried about halfway through the accounts. Um, you need to get the financial statements uh, and, and trot through them. Um, I'm going to be quoting the odd number from the uh, 2008 accounts. That's the year ending September 2008. But frankly, most of these comments would have applied to any set of accounts you picked up of Southern Cross between, well, frankly, from the flotation in 2006. So the fact I picked 2008, uh, which happened to be the year of the profits warning and so on, um, is by the by in some respects. Okay, so red flags from the balance sheet. Number one, there are 10, but I'll go through them fairly quickly. Number one, a huge goodwill figure. All right, now goodwill is a funny old asset. It's intangible. At the top of a balance sheet, you list your long-term assets. Some of them you can kick, like buildings and cars, and some of them you can't, like goodwill. Um, the problem with goodwill was in Southern Cross's balance sheet, it was twice shareholders' total equity. It was a damn big figure for that kind of business. Now, it reflects the fact that Southern Cross went on a buying spree expanded rapidly after it was um, floated in 2006. That in itself is a sort of red flag. Rapid expansion um, immediately post float using cheap money is a warning sign, but a huge goodwill pick like that. The problem with goodwill is this. If the value of the assets you're carrying suddenly drops, you're gonna take a huge hit to shareholders' equity. And a business that's got goodwill of, in effect, twice shareholders' equity makes me nervous straight away. Okay, it's not enough by itself, but it makes me nervous. There's red flag number one from the top of the balance sheet. Moving down, the current ratio. Now, plenty of people hate the current ratio. There are analysts who would slag it off and say it's not representative, but here it does tell a story. What a current ratio does is it asks the question, um, basically, can we afford out of our short-term assets to pay our short-term liabilities? Now again, I have done a video on balance sheets for anyone who's a little bit lost, it's a snapshot. In other words, you know, ha is what we've got short-term in assets enough to cover our current liabilities? And here's the point, even if you're not sure what that ratio is exactly, at Southern Cross, it had fallen by 2008 to really um, a pretty dangerously low level. In other words, current assets only represented half current liabilities. This was a business in trouble. Uh, and sure enough, if you'd read through the background notes, um, we, we were around a time at this point where there were um, renegotiations going with, with the bank over debt facilities um, and all kinds of other red flags flying around this time. But a current ratio of less than, well, you know, certainly less than about uh, one in a business like this is a red flag. And of that current ratio, of the current assets the business had, cash was tiny. Um, so low current ratio, clear cash flow problems. So there's red flag number two. Red flag number three, gearing, debt to equity. Now I've done a video on leverage and that's worth a look if you haven't seen it already. Uh, but basically this was a business where the total debt being carried was over three times total shareholder equity. And that is one heck of a lot of debt to carry in anyone's books. It's no good running the argument, we're expanding fast, we can justify borrowing. That is an awful lot of debt to carry relative to shareholders' equity. No surprise that a debt renegotiation was on the cards. So, so far, big, asset in the balance sheet which we don't really understand goodwill two low current ratio three very high gearing and what was on the balance sheet wasn't the only story off balance sheet there was a five billion horror story lurking now in fairness to find this, you needed to trog all the way back to note 34 in the financial statements. Now, by the time you get to about note 34, most people have lost the will to live. Um, so quite a few people would have missed it. But basically, to cut a long story short, this was a business signing leases, committing it to pay rent that would be raised almost annually, according to an agreed schedule with the landlord, over 
30 years. That's almost a sort of operational suicide note, if you like, and the liability to which the business was committed at the balance sheet date, not all payable at once in fairness, was enormous, dwarfed anything else on the balance sheet. In Venice, it was off the balance sheet. Uh, in other words, it was, it was hidden. But always check for these. It does involve, I'm afraid, rooting through some notes at the back of the accounts. Someone once said the best way to reset the accounts is backwards. That's because the stuff the directors really don't want you to find will be at the back. Makes sense. Um, so, there is red flag number four. Red flag number five, plunging cash flow. Now, there's a couple of ways of looking at cash flow. Cash cover is quite a good way. You can look at the relationship between profits in the profit and loss account and the cash being generated. Um, there is a difference between those two, known as accruals by accountants, but fundamentally um, you need to check that a business that's declaring trading profits is turning it into cash. Plenty of small and large businesses go bust because basically they book a lot of sales but then fail to collect cash from customers. Key customer for this business, the government, local authorities. They're not famous for their ability always to pay on time. And that started to have an impact on Southern Cross quite early. And basically, of course, the debt facility was renegotiated. You can say, well, we know that now, that, that's hindsight, but not really. Essentially, cash flows were not keeping pace with profits. And the overall level of cash for a business of this size as a kind of safety float was dangerously low. So there's red flag number five. Red flag number six is the director's favorite earnings number. Now this one always makes me nervous. Well, it doesn't, even, it doesn't really matter if you're not sure what EBITDA is. There's a video on that, actually. Um, what, what it is is less important than the fact that the directors felt the need to draw attention to it. In the profit and loss account, it wasn't good enough that uh, companies have to report gross profit, operating profit, statutory numbers. Oh, no. Southern Cross decided this was a better measure of how they were doing. Of course it was, because this is the one they can show going up. All right. So adjusted EBITDA, that's earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization. Yeah, take a couple of years, 2007, 2008, the trend is upwards. But compare it to a more normal profit figure like operating profit, or almost any other profit figure you care to mention, and the picture was less rosy. And I'm always wary, I'm afraid to say, I'm always a bit cynical when directors say, no, 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 you don't want to look at the numbers th that we have to produce by law. You know look at this is our special profit figure, we're a special type of business, this is the one you want to look at because it'll be the one that they can show you going up. And probably as a bonus they may have even um, in, in some businesses linked the director's remuneration to it. Great, so you design a scheme guaranteed to make you rich. Of course, um, from a shareholder's point of view, you know, just watch out for this. The director's deliberately steering you towards the number they think you should be looking at. Ask yourself the question, why are they doing that? Um, so, that makes me nervous, that's a red flag in its own right, I think, enough said really. Um, so, other red flags, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, other red flags, now these you didn't need to be an accountant to have a look at, so let's take a couple look at those. Um, key management changes. Any business that loses its finance director, especially a business that's this big and this high profile, that's a red flag, any business that loses its CEO, because after all, why has it happened? Either they were brilliant and they've been poached, well that's not good for this business, or they were frankly rubbish and they've been dumped, um, and that's not good for the business either. So rapid turnover at a senior level in the aftermath of an IPO is a dreadful warning sign. Um, so red flag. And there were plenty of examples of senior management changes through 2006, 2011, um, but perhaps the most obvious one was the loss of the, the finance director about midway through that period. Now, as if that wasn't enough of a clue, directors dumping shares. End of 2007, uh, some of the most senior directors in the business basically dumped 
huge amounts of shares on the market. So in other words, post-flotation, they held onto their shares and then fairly quickly dumped them. That's got to be a red flag. If the people on the inside don't even believe their own story, why should you? Now, I know that after um, that 2007 sale, yes, there was some share buying after that too, but essentially not on anything like the same scale. Um, so, what have we got here? One, two, three, four, five, I mean, six, seven, eight. I mean, how many do you need? Um, so, let's throw in a couple more for good measure, and there are more than 10. These are the 10 biggies. Um, the business model was flawed right from the start, arguably. Blackstone got it right, actually. They owned the business um, between 2004 2006 and were accused of dumping it on the market, uh, having wrecked it. Uh, that's not fair. Um, it was wrecked after that. Um, so when I say the business model was flawed, I don't mean the provision of care is flawed, but you've got over-reliance. I'm always wary of businesses that only essentially have one customer, and that customer was the UK government. The assumption seemed to be um, that um, fees paid to care home providers would always rise, there's a bottomless um, pit of money available that would just flow in from local authorities, no questions asked, because they were so grateful to these um, private healthcare providers for taking all these old people off their books, if you like. Um, well, having only one customer means if that customer hits problems or changes its strategy or changes its policy, you're stuffed. And given that around 80% of Southern Cross's business came from government and local authorities, that should have been enough to make um, anyone, frankly, quite nervous. Okay, any more red flags? Yes, rapid expansion. People say to me, well, that's a good thing, isn't it, Tim? Uh, that means the business is growing. By the way, lots of, lots of places you can find this. I'll explain that in just a moment to wrap up. Rapid expansion, no. Expansion needs to be controlled. It needs to be at a certain speed, otherwise the wheels come off very quickly. Signs, the wheels were coming off very quickly. Okay, what I mean by rapid expansion is basically the number of care homes, once the business floated, shot up in a matter of just a few years by 30%. That's an awful lot of new property and premises to manage. Um, basically, the business was growing the number of care homes and signs that all was not well came from what's called the Operating and Financial Review. That's at the front of the accounts. There is a bit of a story and a few numbers in there. Um, so signs, things were not well and you could pull these all out of the accounts. Number one, rent cover was dropping. What that means is the business was basically signing, having sold off quite a few um, freehold properties that it used to own, the business was busy signing um, long-term rental deals with landlords for new care homes, um, 25, 30 years. So that's a commitment to pay rent. The question you've got to ask yourself is if I'm committing myself to pay rent over a long-term period, what income am I expecting? And here's two problems, both flagged in the accounts for anyone looking for these problems. Number one, um, occupancy rates started to fall. Very bad news when you've just signed a fixed rent commitment. And the cover as it's called rent cover, that's the relationship between expected income and expected rent, started to drop as management got less and less choosy, if you like, about the kind of deals they were signing. So what had been a fairly careful program of managed expansion pre-2006 turned into a bit of an avalanche afterwards and the wheels started to come off pretty quickly. Falling occupancy rates, um, basically bed capacity growing faster than sales, all these things assign that rapid growth was not being managed correctly. So, growth is good, rapid growth can be good, but the business has got to be delivering the underlying profits and cash flow um, to justify it. So, Southern Cross, 10 red flags, there are more frankly, but these are the big 10. Um, some of them very easy to pick up, but the picture that basically comes together from Southern Cross is there was plenty going wrong, and it was going wrong from quite a long way back, and a cursory reading of the accounts would have told you that.